Isn't that just good? <laughs> I love him. I was in a class in my late 20s when I was made aware of him and his work, and I have been following him since. He is a prolific educator, academic, doctor, all the things. He is amazing. And I think for me, what my saving grace has been is I have sought to deepen my spirituality is what he's talking about. Because I came from a spirituality that kind of sidelined other things as less important and somehow was taught explicitly and implicitly that if you had enough faith, you wouldn't need certain things. Bless their hearts, they didn't know any better. They just really didn't. I remember being in seminary going, I just wish nobody had ever talked to me about God. And I'm like, okay, you're swinging too far the other way. Come back, what is reality? Reality is that all things are ours. Whatever it is we need, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, they and all they that dwell therein. If there is a service that you need, you're no less spiritual for tapping into some other things outside of what happens in this building. Y'all understand that? All things are in your service. I'm here today in your service. I'm not here so you can look at me. I hope some of y'all close your eyes and get centered and get into your own space because I'm here to support your growth. I get to help build whatever that means to you. But trust me, I understand my role. I'm a servant leader and I appreciate you guys allowing me to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and trust me, if I ever was to get it twisted, Spirit has something already planned for that. <laughs> I've seen it enough times, so thank you, God. Thank you. Um, wow, beautiful stuff. So what I want to share, and you guys, I'm going to let you in on a little insight, I, because it's true, and I just I feel like sharing with you from a real, sincere space keeps anything weird from happening, any attributions that may not be due me. Y'all know when ministers are preparing their messages, spirit works us over. Y'all know that, right? Like every message that I have ever spoken, there has been a delightful cause to that message, which means this, that I engage spirit about the things that I am doing well, the areas of growth that are needed, and I have to actually do some positioning of myself so I can be receptive to what spirit has to offer because my goal is to be attuned with the people I talk with, all right? I don't wanna just kinda get up here and give a 15 to 20 minute speech. I want to be attuned and in order to do that, spirit knows all things. So that means that I have to allow myself to be positioned for receptivity, okay? So again, take what's for you and leave the rest wherever you go. However, with that being said, I wanna share this with you so that you'll know we're all in process. It was such a cool thing, probably for the first time in my life, really, um, that I felt this real embodied sense of you're too busy. And it wasn't like a correction, it was just like, a trade-off, if that makes sense. It was one of those like, okay, those books that you have stacked up, that, that you're planning on reading, and all the things that you've you know, kind of laid out for yourself. What if I want to just kind of lessen the importance of that and just start to make you more aware, or speak to you, if you will, from your center more and guide you to what I want you to take in? And I'm like, that sounds great because I can fill up my dance card <laughs> in ways that y'all just think, why, girl, no, why, you gonna do all that? And I will tell you, I will try, all right? I set a bar high, but here's the reality of that. What I'm learning is that the power of understanding means the power of understanding what is mine to do and what it's not, even in the simple things. And that is starting to feel so much better. And we'll see how I do. I'll keep you guys updated. So even in the simple things of life, I'm finding that spirit wants to have influence if we let it. It's not about these big things. None of us is going to put on a cape and fly around Orlando and be anybody's savior. We're talking about little practical Christianity things, just practically allowing yourself to attune to your own center so then that spills over in all of our relationships so that we have attunement with one another. So...
Last week, I shared about what Unity Minister Reverend Amelda Octavia Shanklin called the Shining Center. She shares these words. Consciousness held at the surface registers in five periods of activity. Infancy, childhood, youth, maturity, and decline. She understood the developmental realities, and I shared last week that she wrote for We Wisdom. So she really gets this on a human level and a divine level. Infancy is the period of innocence. Childhood is marked by interest. Youth dares. Maturity harvests. Decline is temporary renunciation of what has been gained on the surface, and it culminates in retreat within the solical. When consciousness is held at the shining center, life enters maturity, retaining the innocence, the interest, and the daring of the first three periods. Isn't that beautiful? It's just yummy, right? All excellences of the soul, therefore, even in the period of decline, the innocence of infancy, the interest of childhood, the daring of youth, and the harvestings of maturity are within the soul. If we are phase aware, that, that travels with us. And it becomes right-sized as we get older. I don't know about y'all, but I remember being just kind of crazy in my teenage years. Right? Y'all know how we used to do like superlatives in school, like the best dress, whatever. I got wittiest. That means I beat all the boys. And when I look back at that later in life, I was like, girl, you were just crazy. Because boy, teenage boys are a mess, right? They are so funny and fun. And I'm like, mm, that's interesting. So that kind of like wide-eyed kind of, yeah, that's still in us, OK? All excellences of the soul, therefore, even in the period of decline, the innocence of infancy, the interests of childhood, the daring of youth, and the harvesting of maturity are within the soul, because the soul never loses any of itself. Isn't that good news? The soul never loses any of itself. It can lose what does not belong to it, right? And that's the stuff we're trying to give back to God anyway. Take this. I, mm -mm, I don't know where I got this from, right? Okay? And in order to free itself from the extraneous, it withdraws from the body and in some other manner reincarnates in an effort to come into a clearer consciousness of the shining center. When we leave here, we go back to God, fully and completely aware. Understanding is how we integrate wisdom. So I have a question for you today. Next slide, please. Today's question is, what has been your barrier to applying yourself to the development of understanding in a way that wisdom, intuition, and judgment have a healing effect on your life? Okay, I want you to sit with that if you're willing. What has been your barrier to applying yourself to the development of understanding? We don't have to know it all. We don't even have to understand it. We just have to be willing to become willing, okay? For the development of understanding in a way that wisdom, intuition, and judgment have a healing effect on your life. As I shared with you last week, I shared with you one of my situations. And as I watched that video, it kind of like cringed a little bit, but I'm like, no, it's true. And I was sharing from my heart. With that, I, I thought through this message, and I'm like, what caused me to just kind of escape my own sense of understanding during that period of time and others, for that matter? Some of us are given to giving too much of ourselves and being unaware that we're not receiving back. Because there is a reality, because I've talked to too many people about this and I've experienced it myself, a reality of a Christian ethic that talks about give, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do, 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 do. And if we are not centered in family systems in a church culture that understands that there are periods of rest for our well-being, and that taking care of ourselves really is a priority, we end up very others-focused. You ever been really others-focused? Kind of lost yourself a little bit and tried to figure out, how did I get here, 
right? Okay. And some of us may, maybe you're like me, take it a step further, which is why CODA is a great 12-step program. <laughs> we take it a step further and we start creating attributes for people they don't even actually have. And then we fall in love with them. We're falling in love with our own tellings, our own fantasy. Anybody ever fantasy bonded or trauma bonded with somebody? You don't have to raise your hand, just know. Just, <laughs> We don't have to go there, but just know within yourself, you know, me too. <sighs> Why do we do that? Sometimes we get mixed messages. Give, give, give. Okay, okay, I'll keep jumping through the hoops, right? Whatever that is, it could be a job, it could be an intimate relationship, it could be a friendship, right? But when we come back to ourselves from this space of understanding, we can allow wisdom to speak to us and land in a certain way within us that it hits on every level and we gain clarity. And that's one reason unity is so big on prayer and meditation. Meditation allows us to hold space for expansiveness so that when our intuition flickers and gives us a sense of what is ours to do, we don't just kind of get reactive about it and go, oh no, have you ever been reactive to something that you knew and then had to come back to it months or years later? Right, and you go, oh, this is what spirit was trying to tell me. We have to learn how to get whatever that is, not act like we don't hear it. Go, spirit, I don't even like what I heard, but I think it's you, and I'm gonna sit with it and let it speak to me. Charles Fillmore shares this in The 12 Powers. When we discover in ourselves a flow of thought that, excuse me, that seems to have been evolved independently, independently of the reasoning process. We are often puzzled about its origin and its safety as a guide. In its beginnings, this seemingly strange source of knowledge is often turned aside as a daydream. Again, it seems a distant voice, an echo of something that Maybe we have heard or forgotten, it says this, this is powerful to me. One should give attention to this unusual and usually faint whispering of spirit in humanity. It's not of the intellect and it does not originate in the skull. <laughs> it is the development in humanity of a greater capacity to know oneself and to understand the purpose of creation especially our own creation. You owe it to yourself to not leave the planet without understanding who you really are thoroughly and enjoying that person that you are. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You deserve to enjoy your own being because when you enjoy your own being and you're living into yourself fully, it's easier to connect with people some things we naturally turn away from because they, there's just no resonance. Again, if you're like me and you try to develop resonance with someone that you just didn't resonate with, you know what that feels like, it's dissonance. It's like playing off key. I went to um, Palm Beach Atlantic down in West Palm and we would have chapel every week. I love chapel, uh, I go every week and um, we had one group that came to perform, and I can't tell, because I'm not musically inclined that way. I'm gonna say yet, because I have plans. It's on my list, <laughs> yet, and I especially wasn't you know, at 19. But this group got up to sing, and I'm enjoying it, and all of a sudden I see heads start to turn and whispers are happening, and I'm like, what is going on? And I found out afterwards they were lip syncing. I couldn't tell, but you know who could? Those music majors. <laughs> those music majors could tell, and they were talking about it in chapel, and it was like all the faces, and I was like, oh, I understand, oh, okay, okay, a bit judgy, I get that, okay, I get it, because they could tell there was a dissonance there. It wasn't grounding, it wasn't felt. Most musicians are feelers, right? Okay, they play by, by that deep reservoir within them, and it allows them to create something beautiful. It's not just notes on a page, right? Not just voices. So. With that, the Bible gives many examples of the awakening of this brain of the heart in seers and lawgivers and in the prophets. It is accredited as coming from the heart. 
The, na the nature of the process is not explained, but one who is in the devotional stage of unfoldment need not know all the complex movements of the mind in order to get the message from the Lord. It is enough to know that the understanding is opened in both head and heart when man gives himself wholly to the Lord. Myrtle Fillmore talks about our inner Lord. I remember going through years of being hung up on that. I'm like, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Like my family just would say that all the time. And I'm like, oh, I just got so tired of hearing it. And then when I landed in Myrtle Fillmore's works and she was talking about our inner Lord, it wasn't someone sitting on a throne that we were, she was focused on with a scepter in his hand necessarily. It was about that indwelling directive device that guides and leads us who knows us best. Does that make sense? It made it personal not anthropomorphic. I needed personal God inside directing and understanding what that meant in order to be able to hear that more clearly and more willingly, okay? Because that Lord knows what I need. Your internal Lord knows what you need. Understanding is for all of us. For me, the loving essence of God is something that I have a deep affectionate and commitment to, not just because I'm up here, but because I believe that it is the thing that we need more than all the things. And from that, everything flows out of it. Again, what has been your barrier to applying yourself to the development of understanding in a way that wisdom, intuition, and judgment have a healing effect on your life. When consciousness is held at the shining center, life enters maturity, retaining that innocence, interest, and the daring of the first three periods. Now, when we hold awareness there, we receive a softness and a sense of application that helps us gather all of the parts of us, all the parts of ourselves, into a calm that affects everything we do. Have you ever had the experience of thinking, you know what, my mind is telling me one thing and my heart's telling me another, and yet my gut may be saying another thing, all right? The goal is to hold that space for alignment to happen so that whatever we need to do in order to have a sustained alignment, it happens in that place of silence. It may happen also in a, my favorite um, body scan meditation. I love guided meditations. It brings me right here in my body where everything is happening, not just neck up, okay? Next question. Next slide, please. Are you willing to adapt your life to the development of understanding whatever your spiritual DNA? Are you willing? And if you can't wholeheartedly say you're willing, that's fine. Are you willing to become willing? What then is yours to do at this point in your life? Reverend Imelda also says this, consciousness, if kept at the surface, will betray us. We talk a lot about consciousness, but we got to dig a little bit deeper. What appears to be has no real bearing on the facts that pertain to the soul, but it frequently deceives us and so causes us to substitute the false for the true. The surface changes daily. A look into the mirror for reassurance or for warning is a look into mortality. The surface can have no standard of values because of its inconsistency. Yet, a look into the shining center is a look into immortality, where unchanging perfection is the standard of values. Don't you want to be receiving wisdom, knowledge, intuition, understanding all the things from what is immortal instead of mortality? I want something that's going to hold me and sustain me over time. She says, life is consciousness, and consciousness is of whatever we have trained ourselves to believe. So, 
It is by sincere hope, beloveds, that you are willing to train yourself to believe truths contrary to those who were never truly committed to understanding you. They cherishing you and resonating with you will become your own priority. And in order to do that, you must apprehend understanding of yourself so that you cherish who you are and have resonance between your own faculties because you are exquisite. You are absolutely exquisite. And I hope that you learn how to care for yourself as such. How many of you have heard of Dr. Judy Orloff? Anybody? Okay, beautiful, thank you, all right. Next slide, please. Thank you. Dr. Judy Orloff is a psychiatrist, an empath, an intuitive healer, and is on the UCLA Psychiatric Clinical Faculty. Brilliant woman, brilliant woman. She synthesizes the pearls of traditional medicine with cutting edge knowledge of intuition, energy, and spirituality, and passionately believes in the power of integrating these for wisdom and total wellness leaving nothing out. She has been called the godmother of the empath movement. She's amazing. She shares these words in her book, The Empath Survival Guide. By being vulnerable and strong, empaths represent a new model of leadership. Let me say that again. By being vulnerable and strong, Empaths represent a new model of leadership. We can have a huge effect on humanity by promoting mutual understanding, the path to peace in our personal lives and globally. But such revolutions will last only when the revolutionaries lead by doing their own inner emotional and spiritual work then the positive political, social, and environmental changes we need become possible. Through our sensitivity, we can create a compassion revolution and truly save the world. Yes. She says, I love when the environmentalist Dave Orr says, the planet does not need more successful people. The planet desperately needs more peacemakers healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of all kinds. It needs people to live well in their places. It needs people with moral courage willing to join the struggle to make the world habitable and humane. And these qualities have little to do with success as our culture defines it. So. Are you willing to adapt your life to the development of understanding so that you are really clear about your spiritual DNA because you deserve it and you deserve the joy that comes from sharing your gifts abundantly? You deserve those who resonate with you, who get you, who can even amplify the gifts and graces that you've been bestowed with. Don't let anything stand in your way. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.